Can you hear me in the back? Okay. I'm Steve. I'm Rachel. And we're tag teaming. Okay. <laughs> so, so we're going to uh, tell you, we've been told by uh, the high command at Cornell that you'd all like to hear about how do you make vacuum. So we're going to tell you how to make vacuum, as seen by us. Um, let's go. So why do you need vacuum and what is it? Well, this work, there it is. So uh, UHV in particular is very low vacuum where you need cleanliness for a variety of materials issues and other measurement issues. And you'd like to have control over materials you're growing. You'd like to uh, understand as you grow how pure it is. And uh, this is crucial for this topic with CBV, you know, for light sources of various sorts and colliders. You need vacuum for all sorts of other reasons as well. Field emissions from dirt inside your accelerator. And so this is what you'd like to do. So I'm going to hand off to Rachel to tell you a little about looking at things, and I'll be back. Okay. So we're mostly familiar with UHV in the context of particle accelerator facilities, x files and things like this. But as Steve mentioned, it's also very critical to be able to create techniques where you can understand the exact composition of your surface so you get a better understanding of how you're growing, say, photocathodes, what the photocathode composition is, etc. So one of the main techniques that people can use to understand our surface composition is OJ electron spectroscopy. And this is only possible due to the conditions under ultra-high vacuum, where, as we'll explain later, you have a very large and free path. So when you have a beam of electrons bombarding your surface, ejecting your core electron and causing this free electron cascade, to eject a, an OJ electron, you're able to have that beam that's coming into the surface unperturbed. You effectively eject that core electron, and you can also detect the emitting photoelectron or OJ electron. And because it's going to hit the detector before it collides with another particle and sort of perturbing its fundamental energy properties, you can detect these electrons at a particular energy, which corresponds to a particular element. So this OJ, OJ spectra in the context of niobium or niobium-310, which is what we study in the Sigma group, we can very clearly understand what is niobium, what is oxygen, and in some of the work that Sarah Wilson and I have done the past year or two, what tin is. And this also applies to X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. It's a very similar technique, except now you're using an X-ray source rather than an electron beam to bombard your surface. But because of that long mean free path, Although there has been some interesting developments in XPS, where now you can do high pressure XPS or even at a liquid interface, we're able to see that exact binding energy where you have your signal coming off and correlate it to not only your chemical composition like an OJ, but now you can correlate it back to how is it bound to other surface species? What's the oxidation state? What is your lattice parameter depending on the type of X-ray facility you're using? So all of these different techniques can come together to make UHV technology a very intriguing and useful tool, not only for having your particle accelerator facility, but also for understanding these interfacial science sort of properties, growth parameters, et cetera. So when we talk about UHV, it's the sort of highest level of vacuum in the spectrum of vacuum. There's sort of three main regimes. You have atmospheric pressure, which we're all used to. We live in it. Um, but then you can go down to rough vacuum. We're down to about 10 by 3 torr, so over a millitor region. You have slightly less particles than you do in regular atmosphere, but there's still so many particles present that it is difficult to do some of these sort of high quality, low contaminant studies. You can then go into high vacuum, which is a narrower vacuum range of about 10 by 4 torr to 10 by 8 torr where once again you're getting a little bit cleaner, a little fewer molecules, but sort of the magic of UHV happens when you're lower than 10 by 9 torr, um, down to about 10 by 12 torr, that's sort of the limit of the pressures we can detect, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But as we've mentioned, the higher you go in your level of vacuum, you're able to increase the mean free path of your particle, which I think Steve is going to talk about in a second, so before it collides with another particle, and you're also reducing the residual gas contamination. So how many molecules is your surface going to interact with, sort of perturbing its chemical composition? So as we 
we begin to increase mean free path, decrease residual gas, we have this window opening or door opening to all of these really intriguing analytical techniques. So one of the things about UHV is we need to be able to understand and measure what our vacuum is. So back in the day, um, people had these really interesting setups where you have this glass bell jar and it would evaporate a film of um, sort of a metallic film that was able to trap and capture different molecules. But because of the pressure gauges that they had, they didn't necessarily know if they had genuine UHV conditions. They could only detect down to about, on a good day, like 10 to the minus 8 tour. So they very well may <coughs> have been at 10 to the minus 12 tour, but they just never knew. So one of the interesting things about pressure gauges, and it's sort of similar to what we'll talk about pumps in a little bit, is that there's no single pressure gauge that can go from atmospheric conditions all the way down to UHV. So you end up needing to stagger the different stages of pressure readings so that you can understand <laughs> thanks, um, where your pressure regime actually is. So I'm only going to touch on two of them. One being a Pirani gauge, which is really useful for going from atmosphere down to like mid-high vacuum. And then a UHV compatible ion gauge, which is very good at getting down to about 10 to the minus 12 torr. So this first, as I mentioned, is the Pirani gauge. And it's an interesting gauge technique. You essentially have a wire in there. And the way it works is you have your metal filament. And as gas molecules collide against this filament, there is heat loss or heat transfer. And they have various calibrations where they're able to say the amount of heat loss is equal to this pressure because this many molecules will be hitting your filament in that regime. So this is directly correlating that loss of temperature to pressure. And this way, we're able to go from atmosphere where you'll have a lot of collisions, you're going to have a lot of heat transfer, down to a mid or high vacuum where you'll have fewer collisions, less heat loss, et cetera. One of the really critical inventions of being able to measure all the way down to UHV was the Baird Alpert ion gauge. So this nude ion gauge that we have in a lot of our UHV chambers, where you have your, flange, your CF flange or conflat flange with the feed through, you have your filament cathode, your wires, a mesh grid. And the way that this is able to work is that your cathode is emitting electrons and it's able to sort of guide it towards this grid, which is your anode. And based on the ionization of gas molecules, so this transfer from cathode to anode, you're able to do this direct correlation between how many molecules are hitting your ion. And this can turn on and stay on once you're sort of below one by three tor. If you try to turn on one of these ion gauges when you're at like an atmosphere, it'll just turn off. It can't work. It's overwhelmed. It, it, it's, it's not going to be happy. Um, but one of the interesting things is that once it hits the very low 11s, any reading you get on your controller is going to be an artifact because of this x-ray limit with how the cathode itself works. So starting in about the 1950s when the Baird Alpert ion gauge was developed and built and sort of distributed in the UHV space, we were able to understand where our pressures in our chambers really were once we were getting past that initial limit of the Pirani gauge. Okay, and then Steve. Tag team. So we're going to talk a little about flow. I guess I'm a right-handed point of person. She's a left, so I'll do this one. I'm going to the other side. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, once you know about what you're trying to achieve, you need to design your system. So this is where it gets maybe a little interesting in various ways. And there are different flow regimes. So the first thing you do when you scale an instrument, especially if it involves large gas flows, is you need to understand how big your pumps need to be and how big your plumbing needs to be. Maybe some of you visited our labs when CDP had its meeting several years ago in Chicago. You know, we have all these great pumps, uh, pipes in my labs, which don't have liquid or anything. They actually have vacuum. That's because we have remote. All the roots blowers make lots of noise. That's how you know. So you have different regimes. Um, in viscous flow, you, you have collisions, and this is what we all live with here. And you all know viscous flow, that great milkshake with that straw that you're sucking on, and you wish you had a bigger straw. There you go. Molecular flow is where it gets rarefied, and the particles move around independently compared to the dimensions of the systems. 
And so uh, this is a very important machine. And when you design this, uh, you have to be aware of this, especially if you're dealing with flows or molecular beams or MBE epitaxy. So there are uh, different temperature and pressure effects here, which are classic. And you can get the mean free path from some basic kinetic theory. Some of you, maybe all of you, have had your PCAM or physics basics to school kinetics course. And uh, you have to understand how this goes. And the particles and mean free path chart shows an atmosphere. It's order of 10 to the minus 5 millimeters. And if you're 10 to the minus 9, it's 50 kilometers. So when you get really empty, you don't have to worry about those particles colliding with each other unless you're doing something at CERN or, or the Tevatron or something. So the, the conditions allow for lots of things to be done properly. So uh, there are two different types of things you consider. You need the conductance of your plumbing system, and you need to have the throughput of the system that you're designing for. So you have to deal with the speed of your pumps. So if you have a really big pump and you have a really small straw, you can't suck out a lot of gas, right? It doesn't do anything. So what you need to do is to understand uh, the pressure in chamber number one, and the conductance and pressure and conductance, and then you attach it to a pump somewhere. So the dimensions here scale in various ways, but you have uh, viscous flow, transitional Newton flow, molecular flow, and the dimensions and shape and length matter. You know, if you turn a corner, you can have elbows that are rectangular and other ones that are sweeps, nice and round. They all have very different plumbing conductivity, which you have to take into consideration. So you have the different flow regimes. Uh, you characterize them with Newton numbers, and you can uh, have molecular flow dominating in, in different ways in these regimes, and it's connected with the mean free path. So I think you made the point here. I hope that uh, sizing the plumbing with the pumps and with the experiment you're doing, it's a system. You know, if you mess up on something, the whole system goes down. You have to be very careful. And uh, uh, you can actually understand that there's different regimes. In the laminar flow regime, uh, it goes as the fourth power of the diameter. So you can put a lot of gas through a pipe that's at uh, atmospheric pressure or, or lower. In the molecular flow regime, it drops down to its DQ, and so there's a different scaling for particle flow through these confined tubes. And if you're building a machine the size of this room, you really want to do it right so you don't have to rebuild your, your machine and your accelerator. And the conductance is independent in the flow regime. There's some charts where you can see how that works. Um, where are we going to switch again? The slide after one. One more. Okay. So for UHV technology, uh, you have to, why do you want that? Well, this is a good rule of thumb. In, in, in 10 to the minus 6, 7 tour, you have order of magnitude a second before you have a, a surface worth of crap on your surface. You have to stick in coefficient for unity, right? So if you're building up a, a, a multi layer film, that's a bad thing to do. On the other hand, if you get down to UHV conditions, you, know, you might have a monolayer in extreme conditions of uh, a day or, or hours, certainly, depending on the purity you want. Um, I worked for someone that I think Melissa knows exceedingly well as a postdoc just yesterday, and that was Mark Cardillo. He had also, he's a very brilliant but entertaining person, and he had one or two sayings that I remembered when I was a young postdoc. One was, um, he never met a leak that he couldn't overcome with a big enough pump. So yeah. that, that, there are other solutions to that. Don't have a leak in the first place. And I, he wanted to write a paper where he was very, he wanted me to make sure we could write. We were in 10 to minus 11 tour, true story. And uh, the pressure was like, you know, one and a half by 10. I said, you know, we're not getting there. He said, lower the temperature in the room, Steve. <laughs> or we'll take an ice cube and touch it. So, you know, we got it down to like 9 by 11. So, we'll be right there. so, you know, but you don't want to do it that way, I promise you. Okay. Okay. Text me. <laughs> so, we've sort of given some context of why UHV, different parameters you need to consider, but how do you actually get it? And as we've touched on, you need a variety of different pumping stages to actually move the atmospheric pressure out of your contained system to reach UHV conditions. So when you're looking at a UHV system, you have a few different ranges to consider. You have your scroller rough pump, which is generally looking from atmosphere to rough vacuum. And then maybe you have some four line where you connect into your UHV chamber that may be pumped on a turbo pump, which we'll talk, we're gonna talk about all these pumps in a few minutes. 
um, to get from high vacuum to maybe UHV conditions. And then a third type of pump called an ion pump or a titanium sublimation pump where you can get down even further into the UHV regime. And as we mentioned with conductance and sort of building the shape of your UHV chamber, you need to make sure that all of these components are connected in a way where you can have efficient and thorough flow of the gas load in your system so that you can maintain UHV pressures and detect them using the various gauges such as the Peronian ion gauge. So when we're talking about the gas load in a system, your UHV chamber has a variety of different ways for gas to be in there. Um, so one of the ways that once you have your chamber sealed and being pumped on is you can have outgassing where maybe you have gas diffusing from the bulk of your material into the vacuum space. You can have various leaks if you have a weak well somewhere. You have different pumps that may be forming some type of backstreaming. Maybe you have diffusion and permutation through your UHV material itself into the chamber. So you need to be able to make your system out of the appropriate material. And when we talk about outgassing, this is talking or this is related to sort of the desorption and degassing and outgassing of the material itself. So outgassing is sort of a spontaneous phenomena where the gas molecules are molecules are trapped in your material are going to slowly diffuse off to that interface and go into your gas system. Degassing, where you can actually provoke the desorption of gases, or in some cases, um, like atomic species from your solid or liquid, depending. And then desorption is the phenomena in which these molecules adsorbed on the surface actually release into the vacuum. And we can prompt this behavior by baking out a UHV system where, sort of like Steve mentioned, cooling down to lower your chamber pressures, instead you heat it up to facilitate the desorption and degassing of all of these gases trapped inside your actual system materials. So generally, um, a lot of UHV chambers today are made out of stainless steel, and this is because it has a lower inherent outgassing rate. It is corrosion resistant, so you can run a variety of different gases and species through the system without it sort of corroding and breaking down. And it can be welded, which we'll touch on in a couple of slides. But when it comes to the outgassing rate, if you look at stainless steel as manufactured, you can have water desorbing from the sort of steel itself at about two by 10 toroliters per second per area. So it's not the worst outgassing rate, but that will result in a higher vacuum pressure. But if you bake your stainless steel, where then you raise it up to above at the very least 100 C, so you can get water off from the interior of your cavity, um, but also sort of facilitate the desorption of gases trapped inside, all of a sudden you go down to 10 by 12 outgassing rate. So this will allow for a cleaner system in the end. Now for the materials, I've touched on the fact that they're stainless steel, um, and this is the most common for a lot of applications because of a few inherent properties. By having slightly doped stainless steel, you can have a very stable structure that is low magnetic field, so you can do a variety of different experimental techniques with, of course, low outgassing rate. And when it comes to our stainless steel sort of doping or alloying procedures, you can have sort of your normal 304 stainless steel, which is a common grade for different components, but maybe you want to do low carbon stainless steel so you can have an even lower outgassing rate. Or maybe you want to have a type of stainless steel that's low carbon and even lower magnetic field or susceptibility. So there are a variety of ways that you can prepare your stainless steel to meet different system parameters that you'd like to meet. And if you look at this sort of general outgassing chart, you can see that between mild steel and stainless steel, you have 10 to the 13 versus 10 to the 10 outgassing rates of stainless steel is a superior option. But if we look at the very top, there's also aluminum, which is 1 by 13 outgassing rates. So stainless steel is generally very good, but aluminum is another sort of emerging material for UHV systems that's a bit intriguing. So generally speaking, stainless steel is great for sort of normal generic UHV applications, but you might see in surface science, you know that uh, different accelerator components and studies are done in a stainless steel UHV chamber. But if you want to go into this extreme high vacuum condition or a very pristine low contaminant UHV system, you may be eyeing aluminum as the material for a UHV cavity. And this is in part due to that very low outgassing rate. But unfortunately, 
aluminum is a bit more difficult to weld than stainless steel. So while for our stainless steel chambers, you might have a variety of quartz or flanges coming out, aluminum tends to be a bit more cubical. It's sort of a standard shape and you'll have a direct weld where you can have your flange attached. So there may be some limitations into the structural flexibility of that type of UHV chamber. Now, when we talk about welds, there are also rules for how you weld. UHV is a little bit constrained in some aspects. So generally speaking, when you're welding these UHV chambers, you have two good types of welds. There's a through weld where you're going, or a full penetration weld, where you have a complete weld through the entirety of that junction. Or you can do a type of weld where it's on the vacuum side. So you may have sort of a corner joining where you have your two components and a weld on the interior side where your vacuum is and the atmospheric side does not have the weld. And you have this full range of contact so you have no trapped gas. If you weld incorrectly, where you have maybe an external weld on the atmosphere facing side, you end up trapping this volume of gas in your UHV chamber, creating what's known as a virtual leak and you can be baking and pumping on the system for years and years and years, and you'll never get down to UHV pressures. Um, similarly, if you were to sort of do a tap weld on both sides, that also creates a virtual leak. So there's a bunch of different structural considerations when it comes to these UHV chambers. When it comes to baking out, um, one of the really nice things about bake outs is if you have your stainless steel UHV chamber, it's under vacuum conditions for hours and hours, you sort of have this plateau of the minimum pressure you can reach because of that outgassing rate. But if we set up our chamber to do a bake out where we raise it above 100 degrees Celsius, now we can sort of reach a lower pressure regime because you're forcing the desorption of all these trapped gases and molecules on the surface of your chamber. So by combining these proper welds, proper material, and a proper bake, you can get to much better pressure conditions. And there's a few different ways you can bake. This is the current situation in our lab where we have our UHV chamber inside this elephant colored tent. And you can do a bake tent where you're heating the entire system above 100 degrees Celsius, facilitating the desorption of a bunch of gases that may be on new equipment, on the inside of your walls because you accidentally brushed against it with your arm, et cetera. But if you want to do a more localized bake, if you only need to worry about desorbing water, for example, from a very particular region, you can use things like an IR lamp where you have localized internal heating. So you don't necessarily need this entire setup. So with all of that sort of structural stuff out of the way, now we can talk about pumps, which is one of the things that if you went into any of the labs at UCLA, Yesterday, you could hear that whir of the different mechanical and turbo pumps in the room. So similar to our ion gauges, there's no singular pump that goes from atmosphere all the way down to UHV conditions. So it's really important to stagger your pumping stages to effectively go from atmospheric to rough, rough to high vacuum, and high vacuum to UHV. And sort of this is a nice schematic from one of the pump companies to describe what that system looks like. So when it comes to rough pumps, that's going to get you down from atmosphere. And there's two main types. There is a dry pump and an oil pump. So oil pumps sort of, as you would expect with the name, have oil in the system that facilitate the pumping down from atmosphere, where dry pumps have no oil present, which sort of reduces backstreaming, we'll talk about in a second. And it's very clean for systems that care a lot about sort of ambient or UHV system contamination levels. So when it comes to oil pumps, there's sort of a main pump style for these rough pumps. It's a rotary beam pump. And they're very good at getting down to the millitort regime. So you sort of have the inlet where your gas is coming in. It's compressed through this region where there is oil present. And then you ex sort of exhaust it out. And because it's been compressed and sort of moving through, it's at a bit of a higher temperature and pressure. When it comes to dry pumps, a very common pump is a scroll pump, where you have these two sort of spiral plates rubbing against each other like this, sort of in the gift that you can see. And it's a similar idea where you have a gas inlet that is sucking, or not sucking, technically. But you have the gas coming in, it's being pushed and compressed down through the scrolls into the center point, where it's then exhausted out through your outlet at a slightly higher pressure than the gas that came in. So once we get down from atmosphere, we can then go into the high vacuum and UHV range 
using a variety of pumps for this region, diffusion, turbo, ion, and cryo pumps. So oil diffusion pumps are very common in certain sort of UHV surface science labs, and this is in part due to it can reach pressures down to about 10 to the minus 11 torr, and there is no noise or vibration associated with these pumps in sort of the context of moving mechanical parts. Instead, you sort of have this umbrella jet stream of oil that's able to sort of capture these molecules and facilitate motion out to your outlet. Unfortunately, these do use oil, so they are considered a dirtier type of pump, but if you're able to stack them with a cold trap, either using cold water, liquid nitrogen, or another cryogenic material, you can effectively mitigate any oil backstreaming into your chamber. And since these do use oil, you need to make sure you're selecting the proper type of oil for the system. So generally for oils, there's mineral oils and sort of synthetic or silicone oils. Mineral oils are great for like, if you're trying to get something sticky off of your skin maybe, but it is uh, very susceptible to degradation when hot and it easily oxidizes at elevated temperatures. And silicon oils are more durable than mineral oils, but they also have some of the backstreaming and heat susceptibility properties. A very common oil is a Santivac oil. It's a polyphenol ether based oil. And it has a very high thermal stability and it's very resistant to oxidative sort of degradation. And it has a relatively low vapor pressure and it's less susceptible to backstreaming. And then the off chance that it does get into your UHV system, if you heat your system hot enough, the oil residue can bake off of the walls. So when you're using diffusion pumps, are oil based, if you properly stagger the diffusion pump with a cold trap and the proper type of oil, you can reach clean UHV system conditions. Then we have our turbo pumps, which are very good for UHV systems where you're very concerned about contamination levels. So for our STM labs, we do have turbo pumps on our machines, and this is in part due to the fact that they are dry, there's no oil in the sort of internal pumping mechanism. One of the interesting things about turbo pumps is that they're very effective at pumping down heavy gases, but as you get into things like hydrogen, helium, the lighter gases, they can be a bit less effective. So modern turbo pumps have really sort of improved in the past decades, where now for nitrogen and argon, the heavier gases, we can have a 10 to the 13 compression ratio, so how effectively it's pumping out these gases. And more recently, for even hydrogen and helium, we have relatively high compression ratios, making them effective regardless of the type of gas you're pumping through these systems. And one of the sort of other advances in turbo pumps is that they do rely on a variety of bearings to sort of move the mechanical components. And over the years, we've been able to go from oil lubricated steel ball bearings to hybrid bearings or maglev bearings, where there is either ceramic balls that don't need necessarily oil present, or there's maglev bearings where there's no maintenance involved, very low vibration levels. So maybe turbo pumps back in the day were something that were a little bit finicky, but now they're very standardized and high performance, high quality pumps to get down to UHV conditions. And then when we look at cryo pumps, as Steve mentioned with his ice cube trick, um, this serves as a cold point in your system essentially where now you have your cold head that condenses gas-based particles. So for things like water, which can be a bit difficult to pump, you're able to condense all of that gas-phase vapor pressure onto your cold head so that you can get down to 10 to the minus 11 torr. But one of the things you need to be considerate of when using cryo pumps is that your pumping speed is dependent on the thickness of the condensate on your cold head. So as that gets thicker and thicker, your pumping speed may begin to drop. So you need to take a pause, warm up the cold head, desorb all of the stuff that adsorb onto that cold finger, and pump it out through your outlet. But this is a very interesting alternative to oil diffusion pumps. So when you're deciding what type of pump you want to use, there are a variety of different considerations. So there's the pros and cons, and then you're looking at how clean do you need your system to be, can you tolerate any oil backstreaming, and what vibrational noise levels are you able to accept. So when you sort of go through that list, you're able to decide on whether a diffusion, a turbo, or a cryo pump may be right for you. So then you get into the highest level of vacuum that you can reach, where you're able to get truly into your UHV regime. 
And there are a couple of pumps that are very well designed for this region. And they are your ion pumps or your ion sputter pumps and um, a getter or getter pump and a specific type of that is a titanium sublimation pump. So ion pumps, did you want to switch? Well, every yeah. Just give you a break. <laughs> the only thing I'll add to that nice uh, presentation on turbos is for the real in, in, in the you know in the street experimentalists, sometimes you have to take your controllers for these ion pumps, for the turbo pumps, and put them remotely, like 20 feet away from your STM or other very sensitive instruments. Because then you have to rotate them because they have electric fields, magnetic fields that are generated by their electronics. So there's a little bit of witchcraft involved also. But it's important to be aware that you, you should be aware of what you need to do sometimes. Uh, these pumps are passive, which they're very nice for. I call them personally holding pumps. You, know, you can use them and forget about them. You go away for a nice weekend and you come to UCLA. You can pump your machines with ion pumps because they're closed. So if there's an electric failure or something, you don't worry about very bad things happening. We also want valves that are pneumatic on everything so that your fail safe the power goes off. You know, that's a whole other lecture, basically. So ion pumps uh, are you know, what you see at storage rings and in many other facilities in our labs, many of your labs. They can go really down and empty. Um, they come uh, with magnets, and the modern ones have very low leakage at the top, but it's, it's you can measure them, so you want to be careful with that. And uh, they are ionized and trapped onto these surfaces, and uh, they work in a variety of ways. So, uh, as we say, one person's ion pump is not the other. You need to understand what you're buying and use it. They come in different flavors. Um, you have a conventional diode pumps. Many of you use them. We have differential pumps. These are the only ones we use in my lab, so that's the uh, commercial, I guess. And then you have triode pumps. Um, it's a question of speed and what they're very good for. There are pumps that are absolutely optimized for pumping hydrogen, um, which is also, a, you can have small ones that work very effectively for that. But the uh, DI pumps, the differential ion pumps, uh, this is the sales pitch, are very important because they have the ability to pump uh, uh, rare gases also, not just uh, you know, active chemicals. And because of that, they're, they're very effective. They have tantalum and cathodes of various sorts. There's also triodes, which have different varieties. They're also frequently partnered with um, cryo titanium pumps that you put in. So, one kind of pump you can buy, maybe some of you call them SAIS getters, are these other types where they have an active absorption material that you can activate. A lot of these are used in electron microscopes, is this zero vibration, zero field. You know, they're really passive. And they have zeolites that can uh, capture gases and take you down to very low pressures. These were largely developed in the age of glass vacuum systems. And, and, uh, and now you can have titanium sublimation pumps, which is a slightly more active version of these, where you can spray a fresh coating once a day in the morning or a few times during the day if you have active gas experiments. And they can really give you a lot more pumping speed for a few hours and, and due to the coatings. So you have non-evaporable getters, uh, and you have the ones with titanium where you spritz it around. The evaporable ones, you always have to have a cryo shroud, so you capture the titanium, and then you can uh, not let it get into your system. And this is the ones that we have lots of, many of you have in your labs, where you have titanium filaments that spritz. When you heat them up, they evaporate titanium, they coat the inside of the cryo shrouds. And, and off you go. They have very high pumping speed. It's like Rachel said a few minutes ago that you know, the square area can not only be a source of desorption, it's a source of pumping. So if gases hit the surfaces and they don't go anywhere, you can now have a pumping uh, situation. And uh, these work very nicely. Um, you can achieve uh, modern UHV systems are now, I'd say, a regular occurrence, right? A lot of you work with them or will work with them. Um, it used to be that was a PhD, but th those days are gone. If you design it well, if you have the right wells, which are, you wouldn't be the first people to get a chamber from a manufacturer in an outside well. 
and you send it back for another four months to fix it. So you have to be very careful about the welding. And uh, you can then do all the great science that is represented in CBB in the experimental labs uh, using these types of things. So in summary, come here, you know, we've got our tag team here, but we've got the uh, technologies evolved. You have a whole palette of pumps and materials and chamber designs and size of piping that you can build. And if you do it correctly, you probably can be in the high 11s every day on a nice Sunday morning and do your science. Um, you have all the tools that you can use for analysis with thin films that Rachel told you about. And in particular, what takes a little more uh, design is if you have a throughput system. So I know, you know half of our labs deal with supersonic or hypersonic molecular beams. And there you have very high gas flows, and yet at the end you want to be 10 to minus 11 torr. So you know, there's a very different consideration that, as opposed to a little bell jar with an STM or an electron microscope where it's a closed system. So you have to be aware of what you're doing. And uh, with a little luck, you can build very large systems of all sorts. And I think uh, Rachel and I thank you for your attention. Okay. All right. Um, how low does XHV go? So it can be difficult to figure out just based on your pressure gauges, but generally the regime is like 10 to the 12 to 10 to the 13 torr. And it's meant to more mimic sort of like interstellar atmosphere, like NASA-esque outer space type chemistry and phenomena. Cool. I would have one other comment that what you really are concerned about frequently is the partial pressure makeup. So in your new lab, uh, you care a lot about having no helium. And so your detector actually has partial pressure when it was designed to be about 10 minus 14. The absolute pressure is in the levels, but the amount of helium in it is much lower due to how it was designed. Another question? Yeah, um, I know in your talks a lot, you talk about preparing a clean surface by a combination of like sputtering and then pumping and sputtering and pumping, something like that. Can you talk about that in a little bit more detail? Sure. So um, when you're working, we work with single crystal metal surfaces. So generally speaking, it's sort of similar to the contaminants that are trapped in the walls of your stainless steel chamber. You want to be able to expose your metal surface to a bombarding ion of different gases. We use argon through sputtering. So you ionize, you have your sort of sputter gun that ionizes argon gas that you backfill your chamber with. So we intentionally bring our chamber pressure up to about four by five for argon. And then you have this beam of charged, positively charged particles that bombard your surface and they're effectively like knocking off that sorbate, but also roughening your surface. And then, once you've sort of gotten off a few layers worth of contaminants, you can do an annealing cycle, where you heat your sample up to a little bit below the melting temperature of your sample, because you don't want to melt it in chamber. Uh, that is bad, and has happened a few times in our group. And that effectively restructures your sample back to that single crystal or desired orientation, but also, since you're at very high temperatures, you're driving out surface and sort of near surface or potentially bulk contaminants out sort of through that temperature difference. One of the things to note when you're doing sputtering and kneeling cycles is different contaminants desorb at different temperatures and you're able to reach sort of different depths of driving out contaminants based on the temperatures that you're in. So when you start with a brand new crystal from the manufacturer, sometimes you may anneal at a lower temperature to get some of the easier contaminants to drive out of that surface in your surface region. And then as it's depleted, you can increase the temperature to sort of drive out those deeper bulk contaminants. So it's that combination of bombarding the surface and knocking things off, and then heating it up to drive things out and sort of reestablish your desired orientation. Okay, okay. 